more than 80% of people believe that God created uh, the world. Uh, somehow we are not here by accident. Uh, the problem is, is that when it comes down to this idea of creation, uh, we have, um, especially in our time, uh, conflicting views on how this whole thing happened. How in the world did we get here? It is one of the fundamental questions of life. At some point in time, each of us stop for just a moment and ask, how in the world did we get here? It has to do with, in all reality, our worldview. This series, for the next six weeks, we're going to take a look at what I call six basic doctrines uh, throughout, throughout Scripture. The first one is being creation. Creation is a hard thing. I will very simply say it. Creation is a hard thing. Because for most of us, most of us have heard at some point in time in our education that somehow we crawled up out of the goo. Okay? That is a very prevalent worldview. We've also been taught that somewhere in church that God created the heavens and the earth. And if you are like me, somewhere, sometime you stopped and took a look at how does A and how does B go together? Can they? What is this? Because somehow we take a look at at things and this thing is a puzzle for us to put together. I just very want to simply start today by saying this. Creation matters. It just very simply matters. How much it matters has to do with where you are. How many of you heard, remember the story of the of the little shepherd um, who was working for the town, um, and he went out and he cried wolf. Okay, remember the little shepherd boy who was sitting up on the hill and he cried wolf, and all the people came out with pitchforks, and they were ready to kill the wolf, and he just started laughing. And he does it again, and he does it again, and then a wolf comes along and eats up all the sheep. You remember that story, right? Because he had just very simply cried wolf so many times that nobody would believe him. We're all familiar with this story, but none of us are very familiar with the story about the guy who took his job. Okay? Because the town, if you didn't know this, went out and got more sheep. Okay? And they had to interview a new shepherd. And they interviewed him, and in the interview, and before they gave him the job, said, you need to understand the last guy that we had. Good shepherd, but he cried wolf too many times said, so we will hire you, you go out and watch the sheep, um, and if there's a wolf that shows up, we will all come out with our pitchforks and our torches, and we will kill the wolf. So I got it. I understand the moral of the story. He goes out. He's got his sheep. First night, no problem. Second night, no problem. Third night, no problem. Fourth night. Something's kind of rustling out there in the woods. And he's sitting down and he hears the rustling. And he's trying to figure this. What in the world is that? And he gets the torch out and he sneaks up on it. And then it's, but he starts trying to scream out what it is. But he's so scared he can't quite get it out. It's a, and finally he gets his composure and he yells out, it's a lion. There's a lion in the woods that's coming to come get our sheep. And he's yelling at the edge of the pasture, lion, lion, lion. And nobody's waking up. Nobody's. And the lion comes in and eats all the sheep. 
the next day and the people who hired him interviewed him said, what in the world is going on? He said, you wouldn't believe it. A lion came up, ate all the sheep. There's no lion there. There's no lion in those hills. All we're afraid of, by the way, is wolves. Sometimes we're not afraid of lions. <laughs> we're just afraid of wolves. You see, our point of view in this matters. You see, because in this great debate right now, this, this thought process, how in the world do we do this? How do we process this idea of creation? What is really going on here? One of the things that's hard for me about this subject is to um, try to keep this in about 30 minutes. Uh, creation is one of those subjects that I've spent a lot of time worrying about and pondering, and I really enjoy the idea of cosmology and cosmogony, and I ask a whole lot of hard questions, and I could bore you to death about stuff that in all reality you don't care about. Um... And so to try to do this well, I want you to think about this. Has your life been impacted or has your thought been changed about this idea of evolution? There's a soap called ivory. Okay. And when I was young, that's, the commercials would come on and ivory, 100% pure. Ivory soap, 100% pure. Somebody's like, I don't know if it's really 100% pure. So they went out, set some soap off for some tests, and they had to come up with a whole new jingle. Was 99.44% pure, right? Ivory soap. Now, I want you to think about this for just a moment. See, the reason that creation matters is it has to do with how do we perceive the Bible and how do we perceive God. You see, at 99.44% pure, if we have a thought process that's 99.44% biblical worldview. Here's what this looks like. There's just a little bit that's not. What does that do? So I would like to make the case for you today that there's a biblical worldview. And there is a worldview that right now in our world is out there. And it is not anti-biblical. It is anti-God. If you've ever seen one of the movies, either God's Not Dead or God's Not Dead 2, there is an assault on theology from a worldview that is not just, it's not, I just don't believe in God, but I'm totally against God. And here's where creation matters, okay? You see, I had the privilege in fifth grade. Uh, of, of having a teacher who said, I'm going to teach you these two things. One is that I'm going to teach you this thing called evolution. I'm also going to teach you what I believe is creation. Strange. I got up in the eighth grade, eighth grade science class. And my teacher in eighth grade science class said, you know, I'm required to teach you one theory of origins. But I'm also going to teach you another theory of origins. Oh, I'm blessed because our world has changed since I was in school. And here's how this works. Creation, the doctrine of creation, the idea of creation, as is presented in the Bible, is right here. One of those says, this is right here. This is creation. And at some point in time, you and I hear, oh, hey, somebody did an experiment and we crawled out of the goo. I don't know if 
that's okay. Maybe, maybe there's something to that. Because here's where I've been. I've walked through this entire thing. I grew up believing creation and Sunday school had no problem with it. And as I was getting into the ideas of, 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 of mathematics and physics and science, I had to start wrestling with, oh, well, maybe it's a little bit, well, maybe, here's where I came to, maybe God used evolution. Maybe God used evolution. Some people are here, well, maybe God used evolution. Some people are here, well, I'm not too sure about evolution. I'm not too sure about creation, but I think that there's somewhere in between this that it's okay. Some people are like, oh, well, you know what? I guess it really doesn't matter. We're just here. And then we get to this step that, well, now wait a second. If that's what the Bible says, and I'm all the way over here, that can't be true. I have friends and family members who have, at some point in time, when they were listening and, and learning and trying to process this whole thing about creation, have come to the point that said, well, I know this is right. That has to be wrong. And here's what happens. At the point in time that we say that the Bible is wrong, we've lost some things in our world. Here's some interesting statistics. Um, that a, a relatively good kid, a relatively good kid, okay, who just is growing up and doesn't have a biblical worldview, okay, 48% greater to cheat on a test than somebody who believes in creation. 48% chance. 200% chance that they're going to um, be more inclined to lie about things like taxes. 600% more chance that they're going to be inclined to commit violent crime. Creation matters. Now, I've had to work through this whole creation evolution thing, and here's what I've discovered. The more I get closer to the Bible, huh, the more this makes a little bit more sense. Oh, hey, you know what? I can see this evidence. Oh, maybe I need to think this through. Maybe I need to take God at his word when he said he created the heavens and the earth. And I'm still not exactly sure how this works. And I get to hear, and I get to hear, and I will be able to tell you today, um, I have sometimes crazy, weird opinions about this thing called creation that my friends who are here <laughs> say, Larry, you're a little weird. Like, that's okay. I'll take a little weird some days. What I can tell you is, is that the idea of creation is our first step away from a biblical worldview. And wrestling through creation will often be a person's last step in returning to a biblical worldview. Because it has to do with several things. You see, this whole thing in Genesis 1 1. Whoa, okay, there's a thing behind me. It scared you. It scared me. Wow. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. My wife's always like, everybody's breathing. Okay, we got, got your attention apparently, right? <laughs> In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. At some point in time, we have all questioned that <laughs> to some extent. And it has impacted our world. And how, what happens here is that we have to either decide, well, is it evolution, is it creation, is it intelligent design? How does this exposure to evolution change us? I'm going to show you an extreme case of how evolution changes thought. 
okay? Uh, I get it. You're going to say, Larry, holy cow, not really. Really? Really? Our world is wrestling through this whole idea. And here's why. Did God create man and woman? Now, there may be, you may be thinking here, sitting in the church today, like, I didn't know this was an issue. Is anybody here aware of this issue? Well, we are to some extent. Okay? We understand the world we live in is really bizarre some days. I mean, we had discussions over adding a third bathroom in our culture here, right? And I'm just saying it's coming. But it's part of what evolution does. This is called the New Interpreter's Study Bible. The New Interpreter's Study Bible. And what this is, is that it's the, it's the Bible with articles written. And on this page, there's about a third to a fourth of the page, which is scripture. And at the bottom of the pages are these articles that are written about this. And I want to show you this statement. I have something to say. Oh, it can't be that bad, is it? Again, the New Interpreters Study Bible. In the idea that God made male and female. In the Eden narrative, and this is on page 10 of uh, talking in Genesis 2. So the Eden narrative has been used throughout history to blame women for the origin of sin in the world. And to legitimize the subordination of women to men. According to this perspective, Eve initiated the couple's disobedience because of the forbidden first fruits and then tempted man to eat it. Okay. Uh, Eve's subordination to Adam is then regarded as her punishment to this sin. Her subordination is reflected among the perspective of the fact that man was made first and that the woman was derived from him to be made to be his helper. Okay. Now that's... That's where this is. Um, it goes on to say that the woman does not, in fact, have a secondary place in a creation story. I don't dispute that statement. Don't dispute that. Because the first person made was a human being, not necessarily male. The word, it talks about it, should be translated in a general sense of humanity. So that the first person is understood to be a human being without gender or containing both genders. <sighs> New interpreters study by them. Now the reason I say this. Is that from an evolutionary thought, that makes sense. But it contradicts Scripture's statement that God made them male and female. You see, the reason that creation matters is that we are in a culture that is losing our identity at an accelerating rate. We are not teaching our kids. We are not being able to communicate to them. This is what the Bible says. And here it is. We have given up with the scientific arguments. Not everybody has, but by and large, we have given up trying to argue with what is called scientific arguments for evolution. Now here's some things that this leads to. When you take out the idea of creation, that in creation that God made them male and female, that he made us male and female, here's the first thing you can do. You can start by eliminating the concept of marriage. You see, the idea here of evolution is, is that if there is, well, you know, back in Genesis, this thing that was human had both sexes. Then marriage is kind of an old-fashioned thing. 
And marriage, what happens is, is that there is a uh, there's an attack on marriage that happens. In Mark chapter 10, in Mark chapter 10, here's how the attack on marriage looks like. Okay? You see, if you if you buy into the fact that evolution is okay, and creation doesn't really matter. Here's some things you have to wrestle with here. Uh, some of the Pharisees, in, in Mark chapter 10, verse 2. Some of the Pharisees came to Jesus and tested him by asking, Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Is it lawful for a man to divorce his wife? Well, what, what did Moses command you? Jesus replied. Well, they said that Moses permitted a, writ, a, a, a right to, to write a certificate of divorce and to send her away. Now, here it is. Uh, marriage has been under attack. Divorce, hurtful thing. Get it, okay? Um, I think I could be wrong in this. Um, scripture says that God hates divorce. Scripture does not say that he hates the divorcee. Okay? I want that very clear. But there's something here, the way Jesus articulates the answer, that in this answer, the idea of marriage and divorce goes back to creation. He says, it was because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. In Jesus' day, the evidence is pretty good, okay? That a man could divorce his wife because he doesn't like her cooking. Nowhere does it say that a woman can divorce her husband because she doesn't like his cooking. But get this. He said your hearts are hard. See, we will start looking for excuses. And to justify it. And we do. I've, I've, I've visited with couples throughout, I mean, just throughout my, my, my life. Just, oh my goodness. Well, yeah, but get over it. <laughs> you know, you chose to get married, stay married. I had a good friend who never went to church said this to me. He said, Larry, the best thing a man can do is to wake up and fall in love with the person that he wakes up with every day for his entire life. The person that you wake up next to, your wife, fall in love with her every day. Got it. He says, because your hearts were hard that Moses wrote you this law. He said, but at the beginning of creation, God made them feel male and female. You see, Jesus goes to the defense of marriage back to creation here in Mark chapter 10. He said, for this reason, a man will leave his father and mother and be united to his wife. And the two will become one flesh. They are no longer two, but one. Therefore, what God has joined together, let man not separate. And this is a passage that we quote at weddings. You hear this done at weddings. Weddings, very simply, marriage is a testimony to the idea in creation that we were created male and female. If you take away creation... You can take away the concept of marriage. And let me ask this question. Have you seen the concept of marriage come under attack in the last 20 years? We have. You see, this evolutionary mindset that has crept into how it is that we live matters. The next thing that this does is it will creep into our, our idea of godlessness and wickedness. Now, here's the thing. Even in today's world, we don't like to use the word wickedness. Okay? About the most wicked thing we know of is the wicked witch of the West. Follow what I'm trying to say? Think about the last time, and not wicked, like, oh, that's so wicked. No, 
Think about the last time you called something wicked. And, you know, with the idea of, not that that's wicked, cool, but that's wicked as in really wicked. My, am, I, am I making sense? Right. At least Patty and I are communicating. We're okay here, right, dear? Um, so, so here's the thing. Creation and our walking away from it will reduce our idea of what is acceptable. In Romans chapter 1, here's the passage here, uh, starting here in verse 18. He says, The wrath of God, Paul writes, is being revealed from heaven against all godlessness and wickedness. In other words, God's up here, it's like, oh, hey, Godlessness and wickedness, I'm going to deal with it. Okay. Since what may be known about God, excuse me, against all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since that all may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them. He says here in verse 20, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities... His eternal power, his divine nature, have clearly been seen, being understood. What has been made so that men are without excuse? In other words, even without scripture, even without scripture, you and I, to some extent, God has been able to do this thing in the world around us for us to be able to take a look at things and say, wow. Wow, that's that's um, that's amazing. In the last couple weeks, the right time in the evening, you can walk outside. Amazing purples and oranges. I love my smartphone, I kid you not. Whenever I take a picture of nature, it's like, oh, that sucks. Maybe your phone doesn't do that. Oh, this is amazing, I need to take a picture of it. Well, that's not any, what? That's not anything that that looks like. Post it on Facebook anyway. Cheesy picture. Ugh. I might just think I'm the only one like that. I hope not. Because we take a look at the picture, it's like, oh, that's nice. But you take a look at the reality, and it's like, oh, that's amazing. You see, we lose something. Somehow God said, you'll be able to see me in those things. You see, we live in this world where God has made it plain, but we refuse. And here's what happens in Romans chapter 1. He said, For although they knew God, they neither glorified Him as God nor gave thanks to Him, but in their thinking they became futile, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images of made to look like mortal man, birds, animals, and reptiles. And Romans chapter 1 here deals with the core of idolatry. And that is somehow that the creator God out here, who we can see, is somehow not all that great. So let's take images. Let's do something different. Let's see what happens. And here's what happened as God's pouring out his wrath in verse 24. He said, therefore, God gave them over to the sinful desires of their heart, to sexual impurity, for the degrading of their bodies with one another. And they exchanged the truth of God for a lie. And they worshiped and served created things rather than the creator who is forever praised.
Romans 1 goes on further to explain what happens the farther we get away from a biblical worldview. You see, we live in a world that while we don't think it's as bad as it is, we walked away from God. Because somehow, Creation isn't really that big a deal. Now here's what I want to leave you with. You see, Scripture talks about the wickedness and the godlessness of the human heart. We, by ourselves, are not good people. My brother-in-law, who's a pastor, says this. It's amazingly how quickly man can get, how, how quickly we as men can slide into perversity when left alone. Oh, golly. Yes, we will slide into perversity quickly. Because it just seems like that's what we ought to do. Somehow, the human heart, as God takes a look at it, is never fixed. The human heart, follow, follow me on this for just a second. Have you ever read a self-help book? Right? Self-help book. Oh, think this way, do this way, if you feel this way, and it'll be better. You see, God is, it's impossible for God to, I'll say this, follow me on, fix the heart. Because our heart cannot be this is what the psalmist says. He says, Create in me a clean heart. Create in me a new heart. That there is a new creation. That thing that is old, that is dead, is replaced with something new. It cannot be fixed. Now, I don't like it when people restore old things. You know, cars, amazing. I mean, you can, there's a lot of things you can do that. But it's not new. Right? You see, God doesn't say, oh, hey, you know what? You're broken and messed up. Let me fix you. God says this. You are broken and messed up. Let me recreate you. You see, if we can't, if we don't believe that God created something in the first place, we are more than happy to settle for God can just fix us then. But God doesn't just want to fix you and me. He wants to recreate you and me. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It is this, here's this amazing thing here. This sounds ludicrous. I get it. Paul knows it sounds ludicrous. This is one whole big ball of crazy in the Bible. You see, what we think it ought to be there is that God says, oh, gee, you're nuts. This is, believe this foolishness and somehow it will recreate your life. Really? Really? 1 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 13 says, if we are out of our mind, it is for the sake of God. If we are in our right mind, it is for you. For Christ's love compels us because we are convinced that one died for all. Therefore, all have died. You and I have died because Jesus Christ has died. That's a whole big ball of crazy in this world. Because the last you checked, you still want supper today, right? I know we got lasagna. Know, we got some kind of pizza, pasta, something going on in our crock pot. And I can't wait. What time is Soon. <laughs> Probably another three hours. Three hours. Now, watch this. He died for all, that those who live should no longer live for themselves, but for him who died for them and was raised again. You see, from now on, we regard no one from a worldly point of view, though once we regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He is a new creation. 
The old is gone. The new has come. And all of this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us this ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself through Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us this message of reconciliation. See, God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that in him we might become his righteousness. Here's what happens. If somewhere in our heart we dismiss creation, we are also dismissing God's most powerful thing and that is his ability to recreate us. Without creation, we doubt the power of God. Without creation, we live without God's power. Because the power that said, let there be light. Is the same power that says to you and to me, Christ makes you.